Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus, bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Lord God. Hallelujah. 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 Bless your name, Lord God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. We honor you. Hallelujah. Glorify you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your holy name, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all forgive the feedback. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, I'm gonna get this technology together after a while. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we thank you. God, we honor you. God, we bless you. God, we adore you, Father God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless your holy name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So welcome, 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 everybody. Welcome to the He Got Up Resurrection Service hosted by Be Free Ministries and myself, Minister Stephanie Humphrey. It is such a blessing to have you join us for the service on tonight. Please forgive the feedback. I had, did have a couple of technical difficulties happening on this side, but it's okay, tech. Um, difficulties happen and it's all good. It's okay. We're praying that I'm going to make the investment into some new technology. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's a struggle because I don't want to do it, but y'all pray for me here. But welcome to the He Got Up service. We are so excited for what the Lord did on last night and for what he's going to do tonight. Hallelujah. I might get a little bit into Deacon and Sasha Owens' message, but I'm going to try to stay out of it. Hallelujah. Because when I think about the resurrection power of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and how his resurrection secured my victory, hallelujah, his resurrection, decreed and declared that I am an overcomer, his resurrection, decreed and declared that I am victorious. Y'all, I get excited about it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I'm excited about the word on tonight that our Savior did not stay in the grave. Hallelujah. But he did rise on the third day. So again, I'm going to quiet down because I know my, my cousin, Deacon, Deacon Natasha, oh, she's probably looking at me side eye right now. Praise God. And she's going to get me when she comes home, but it's all good. <laughs> So again, welcome to the service. Let me pray. You all, my voice is still a little bit hoarse. And while I want to sing, I'm not going to sing tonight. I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to introduce our speaker on tonight. And Deacon Sasha Owens is going to come to us with God's word. Amen. God, we thank you for this day that you have made. We rejoice all day and we were glad in it, Father God, and we rejoice right now. And we are so glad, so thankful, God, for this moment of hearing your word, Father God. We, Before we get there, God, we thank you for blessing us all day, Father God, through the situations that we had to navigate, through the people that we had to talk to, the teams that we had to manage on our job. God, we thank you for being with us, for giving the wisdom, Father God, to lead on our job, God, if we were at home resting, if we are, are, were at home retired, Father God, we thank you for our at-home time. 
we thank you for being with us while we were at home, wherever we were today, God. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for ministering to us. Hallelujah, God. Thank you for comforting us. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy that was abundant in our lives today. Hallelujah, God. And we thank you for this appointed time. Hallelujah. To hear your word about Jesus' resurrection. Hallelujah. The fact that Jesus got up on the third day. Hallelujah. Securing our victory. Hallelujah. Sealing our salvation. Hallelujah. God, we thank you. Oh, for this time of learning, God, for this time of growing, God, for this time of expansion. Hallelujah. For this time of encouragement. Hallelujah. God, we thank you. Hallelujah. For being in the midst of the teaching on tonight, God, for being in the midst of this service on tonight, God. We welcome your anointing. We welcome your power. We welcome your healing. We welcome your deliverance. We welcome your salvation. Hallelujah. We welcome your correction. Hallelujah, God. We welcome, God, you to pour into us, God, all that we stand in need of on tonight. Hallelujah, God. You see our need, God, and you know what we've been um, petitioning you for. God, so grant our request on tonight. Hallelujah. And meet every need, Lord God, according to to your riches and glory. God, we thank you for blessing the woman of God tonight. God, we know that she's already studied and she has a prepared word, God. But if you want to speak to through her prophetically, God, we welcome that. God, we welcome, God, the mighty move of your spirit through the woman of God. Hallelujah. God, help us to set our cups out, God, to receive, God, what you want to pour into us, God, through the woman of God on tonight. God, we thank you for the word. God, that she will deliver us unto us on tonight, God, for the taught word, God, for the preached word, for the powerful word, Father God, that will birth out of her belly on tonight, God, we thank you, hallelujah, God, that your word, hallelujah, will heal, deliver, set free, God, we thank you that your word will encourage us, God, we thank you that your word will admonish us, hallelujah, we thank you that your word, God, will give us direction, hallelujah, oh, God, we thank you, God, for speaking your word to us on tonight through Deaconess Tasha Owens. God, we pray that you will anoint her refresh, Lord God, and that you will speak mightily through her lips, Lord God. We thank you, God in advance for all that you are going to do on tonight. God, we thank you in advance for what you will say to us. God, we thank you in advance for how you will minister to us, God, how you will minister to our spirit, Lord God, how you will minister to our soul, Lord God. We thank you in advance for personal ministry on tonight, for personal revival on tonight, for restoration on tonight, God, for a refreshing on tonight. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for all that you're going to do in the service on tonight, God. You are most welcome to have your way and move by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. God is a good God. Hallelujah. And he is worthy to be praised. So let me introduce our speaker on tonight. She is my cousin, Deacon is Tasha Owen. She is an intercessor, a warfare and prophetic intercessor. Yes, she is. She is a financial guru. She is a mother. She is a wife. She is a friend. She's my cousin, but she's also my friend. She is a woman of wisdom. Hallelujah. A woman of counsel. Hallelujah. There is safety in a multitude of counsel, and Tasha is part of that multitude. She is, you can find safety in the word of wisdom and counsel that she has in her belly. And we thank God for the woman of God and for the word of God that she will deliver to us on tonight. So set your cup out, grab your Bible, get your journal, your ink pen, your tech device, whatever you're going to use to take notes tonight, get it out so that we can receive what the spirit of the Lord has to say through this mighty woman of God, Deaconess Tasha Owens. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Minister Humphrey, for the um, invitation for tonight. Thank you for that um, introduction. Um, God is worthy and he is worthy to be praised. We just thank you for this opportunity, Father, um, to share your word on tonight. 
God, I ask that you would just have your way, oh God. Use me, oh God. Speak through me, oh God. And get the glory out of every word that is said, oh God. God, let your word be fruit, God, to your people, a seed of a seed of fruit unto your people, oh God, that it may produce a harvest in its season, oh God. In Jesus' name, let your word be blessed, God, and we will all be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm um, happy um, Holy Week. Uh, we are in the second day of Holy Week. We are um, observing and remembering the work of Christ during this week in preparation for the great day that will be coming on Sunday where we celebrate his resurrection, his resurrection power, his resurrection strength, um, all that is encompassed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So on tonight in this He Got Up um, service, my subtitle or my subtopic that was given to me is Jesus Got Up. So He Got Up, Jesus Got Up. So when you hear that someone got up, you may think of some common things. Um, I got up from sleeping. I got up from sitting, a sleeping or sitting position. You may think I got up from falling on the floor. You might think I got up to speed on something that wasn't known. Um, so tonight we are going to look at three. He got up miracles in the New Testament. Um, so there are a few occasions, a few miracles in the New Testament, in the New Testament that um, someone got up from something. And so tonight, since we are um, anticipating the resurrection of Jesus, we are going to look at, at we're going to look at three miracles um, of being raised from the dead. And um, each of them is important in establishing the humanity and divinity of Jesus as the son of man and the son of God. So we're just going to get right into it. Our first example, our first um, biblical story is found in Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. Again, our first event that we're going to look at tonight, our first, as I call him, he got up miracle. Our first he got up miracle <laughs> is found in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, and I'm going to read in the New Living Translation. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciple to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. When he walked over to the coffin and touched it, the bearers stopped. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bear stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Um, so I believe that this was an unexpected or spontaneous act of Jesus. And I say that um, in reference to the next two that we're going to get to. Um, of course, we know nothing is, an, is unexpected that Jesus does. Nothing is spontaneous. But um, you'll understand what I, what, I, what I mean by that as we go on. So um, Jesus was passing through this small village of Nain. And although this widow was surrounded by a procession and a large crowd as she was going to lay her only son to rest, she was not only alone now, but likely poor. 
and facing a future where she was unsure of how she would survive. There were no jobs for widows, and without children, she was left dependent on the generosity of the community, as often widow widows were. But upon approaching this funeral procession, again, Jesus was just walking by and he walked up on this funeral procession. And upon him approaching the funeral procession, he stopped and he saw the widow's compassion. He saw the widow's situation with, with compassion that caused him to intervene. Hallelujah. How many of us know on tonight that we have had some situations, we may be in some situations right now, and we can um, rest assured and we can find hope in the fact that Jesus will look on us, look on our situation with compassion. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, we can believe on tonight that our Savior will look upon us with compassion and not only a compassion that just causes him to um, um, feel some type of way for us, but that compassion causes him to intervene into our situation. Praise the Lord. And that is what Jesus did for this woman. He had was moved with a compassion that caused him to intervene. He touched the coffin, raised the sun, and gave the son to his mother, gave the son to this widow. Now, in this these short verses, um, there Jesus only said two things. He only said two things in these verses. And the two things that he said that are very powerful and helpful is, don't cry. He said to the widow, don't cry. And in this, what he did was he consoled the grieving widow, as she had lost her hope of being cared for. Um, we have to realize that in this time, again, women depended on a husband to care for them. And if they had children, especially sons, if when they became a widow, the sons took care of the woman. But in this case, she was a widow, which meant she lost her husband. And now she has lost her only son. So she um, didn't have, she may have lost her hope of being cared for. But Jesus again consoled her by saying, Don't cry. The next thing that Jesus said was to the son. Now remember, the son was dead. The son was dead. They are in the funeral procession on their way to bury him. But Jesus said to the son, get up. <laughs> Woo. He restored the son and returned him to the mother so that he could provide for her social and economic well-being. That's a powerful word for someone tonight. Get up. Whatever the situation is that you're in, it's not too late. Doesn't matter how long it's been. Um, doesn't matter how bad the situation may seem. You can get up. When once Jesus has compassion on you, when Jesus is moved to intervene on your situation, that is all you need for a miracle to get up. Now, this was the first miracle of Jesus raising someone from the dead. And it was the 11th overall miracle that Jesus performed. The crowd was filled with awe and praise God. Now, the response of the crowd was that they announced Jesus as a great prophet that had appeared and spread the news, and they spread the news about Jesus throughout the surrounding country. So we have to remember at this time, um, Jesus had not yet revealed himself as a son of man. So at this time, whenever they declared him to be a great prophet, they were most likely were leaning on the fact that they knew of a familiar story in the Old Testament where Elijah, who was a prophet, raised the son of a widow at Zarephath. 
So that most likely was the reason for the way they responded to him. So although Jesus had not yet revealed himself as son of man, this miracle did in fact improve him to be the son of man. So maybe some of you have lost something. It may have been a natural death, meaning that someone has passed away. It could mean a relational death, meaning that ties were cut with someone that you once loved. Also, maybe you've lost something, um, maybe a job, a home, a business, a dream, whatever it was that you have lost or whomever it was that you have lost. Um, we understand that there is a normal and a proper um, time of grieving. So this statement that I'm going to make, is not being insensitive to that. And we understand that it takes different time, lengths of time um, for the grieving process. Everybody is different. So again, nothing against that. Yes, take it is normal. I'm saying again, it is normal to grieve. It is proper to grieve and take the time that you need. But I just want you to understand that in that situation that you have lost, there is a time where your tears of sadness can be replaced with getting up and embracing life beyond that which ceased to exist, okay? So something ceased to exist, but that doesn't mean it's the end for you. While you are still living, you can get up and embrace life beyond what ceased to exist. Another point from our story is, when we feel forgotten, so we look upon this widow and we can imagine she may have, um, we might, we can also have compassion with her because in our own situation, we may have felt forgotten, overlooked, discouraged, insignificant, but we must remember God is our refuge. He's a very present help in trouble. He is our greatest source of hope and help. He is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, he is ever-present. So in your most desperate time of need, call on Jesus, call on him and he will answer. Call on him and he will look upon you with compassion that will cause him to intervene. The word tells us that we can cast our care upon him for he cares for us. He is a compassionate savior. He is a compassionate God. He is a compassionate Lord and King, and he cares for us. So our first He Got Up miracle, again, was found in Luke, and it is the miracle of Jesus raising the son of the widow at Nain. Now, our second Get Up miracle we can find in John. John chapter 11 um, in the story, the complete story is told in the entire chapter of John chapter 11, but we're just going to read the part um, that talks about the miracle. So John chapter 11, verses 38 through 44. John chapter 11, verses 38 through 44. Again, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. For the sake of our, um, our title, Lazarus, get up. <laughs> And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. Jesus told them, 
unwrap him and let him go. Now, like I said, the first story was a spontaneous um, act of Jesus. This was the opposite. This was a very purposeful act of Jesus. Um, so again, we didn't read the verses leading up to 38, but we, uh, we're going to recap them. Jesus was sent word that Lazarus was sick. The expectation was that Jesus would come and heal him because of their friendship. Jesus told his disciples upon hearing of Lazarus' um, sickness that Lazarus' sickness would not end in death. And Jesus remained where he was for two days. My God, we're going to get that into that in a minute. But <laughs> sometimes we have a situation where we call on Jesus and we expect him to come and heal us. We expect him to come and help us. We expect him to come to our rescue. But sometimes he remains. Sometimes he seemingly to us, delays his coming. Jesus arrived at Bethany after Jesus had been dead for days. So remember, Jesus was sent word when, when Lazarus was sick. Jesus was Lazarus' friend, okay? <laughs> so first, Jesus stayed where he was for two days. And then when he made the trip to Bethany, Lazarus had been dead four days. So remember what Jesus told the disciples, though, that Lazarus' sickness would not end in death. And we know that to mean um, it wasn't going to end in a literal death. Although literally, he really was dead. And he was dead for four, for four days. So Lazarus, um, also when Jesus arrives after Lazarus had been dead for four days, Jesus told the disciples something else, that Lazarus had fallen asleep and he was going to wake him up. All right. So Lazarus was sick. Lazarus died. But Jesus said his sickness would not end in death. And then Jesus also said that he had only fallen asleep. And he's going to wake him up. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha, who lived with him. They, along with their brother, were known to be friends of Jesus, as we have said. They believed Jesus could have asked God to heal Lazarus had he gotten there sooner or even just spoke a word. That's something that Martha, both Martha and Mary said to Jesus um, at two different times. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, uh, Martha came out to meet him and Jesus said, um, and Martha said, excuse me, Jesus, if you had been here. And then later when Mary saw Jesus, she said the same thing. Jesus, if you could, would have been here. But now Jesus is here. <laughs> And that lets us know that it's never too late. It is never too late. Our situation um, is never doomed and gloomed where whenever Jesus does arise, he can't do something about it. So again, in this passage, we're going to focus on Jesus's response. When Jesus saw Mary and Martha weeping and the mourners wailing, he was greatly moved. Again, the compassion of Jesus. We talked about him a few minutes ago, him being a, 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 a compassionate God, a compassionate um, savior. He was greatly moved. He was deeply grieved and he wept. So if we didn't know before that Jesus um, was human and all, while he was also God, we this definitely speaks to his hum humanity where he wept. Jesus, upon arriving, told the people to roll the stone aside. And when he did, Martha protested because the, Martha said, he's been there now four days. He stinks. 
So how many of us even have some situations that have been dead a long time, some situations that now are stinking, some situations that have um, a stench, which I think is probably worse than stink, right? <laughs> but again, we can be assured that it's never too late. When Jesus intervenes, when Jesus comes on the scene, it is never too late. And Jesus reiterated to Martha that she would see God's glory if she believed. So as long as we have our belief, as long as we keep believing Jesus, no matter what we see, because remember, we can see something and we can believe something different, right? We can see something, we can um, even feel something, but that has nothing to do with how Jesus will respond once we believe. And it's hard sometimes. It's hard to see something um, that we are going through, something that we're experiencing. Um, it's hard to believe when what we believe is different from what we see. But nonetheless, Jesus promises us that if we believe, we shall see God's glory. So the next thing that happens is Jesus prayed out loud to the Father, giving thanks for hearing him, which he often did. There are other miracles as well, where before Jesus performed the miracle, he prayed and asked the Father uh, and gave thanks to the Father, excuse me, before he did, because we realized that Jesus didn't do anything outside of what the Father's will was for him. And so he gave thanks to God, to the Father for hearing him, that the crowd might believe that he was sent by the Father. Jesus shouted with authority for Lazarus to come out. Then Jesus told them, the people, to unwrap him and let him go. So we're going to come back to that one, to that in a minute too. Um, but in talking about this, this get up miracle, this was the third miracle of Jesus raising someone from the dead. Um, we didn't talk about the second one because that didn't go with our theme if he get he got up. The second, the second miracle was of a young girl. So that would have been she got up. So anyway. This we're going on to the third miracle of Jesus raising someone from the dead. And this is the 33rd overall miracle that Jesus performed, demonstrating not only that he was the son of man, but through the absolute power over life and death, he was revealed also as the son of God. Now, among this crowd, there were um, different types of people. There were some who believed and stayed and followed Jesus. And then there were some that went away to report what they saw that Jesus did to the religious leaders who plotted to kill Jesus. By this time, and the difference between the first um, miracle and this one was by this time, by it being his 33rd miracle, there, his, um, there was widespread Spread, there was widespread belief in Jesus, which was a threat for the religious leaders. So a couple of things that I want to um, point out about this miracle. So if we think about what happened, we think about the players, we want to point out that the testing of our faith does not mean the denial of God's love. Let me say that again, or I say it a different way. God does love us, yes. And out of his love for us, sometimes our faith is testing. When our faith is tested, it doesn't mean that God um, doesn't love us, right? So the testing of our faith does not mean the denial of God's love. Our entire relationship is based on faith. We were saved by faith. We live by faith. We walk by faith. James chapter one, verses three and four tells us that the testing of our faith produces patience. 
And once patience has its perfect work, we will be perfect. We will be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So it is purposeful um, that our faith be tested. And again, even when our faith is tested, we must know, we must remember that God, God's love is still in operation. All right. The next thing that I want to say is when we face God's silence, we must be assured of his presence. When we face God's silence, we must be assured of his presence. In this story, we understand that when they sent for Jesus, Jesus did not respond immediately. So there was silence. There was not a return from um, the sending that they had for him, but he was yet present. He was yet aware of the situation. He was yet um, mindful. He knew what he was going to do, even in his silence. He is still present. God is near. He's close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. When we don't understand his delay, and when his instructions don't make sense, sorry, this is another point, we must not insert our own reason or logic. So again, when we don't understand his delay, remember, Jesus was delayed two days before he even started to travel. By the time he got there, Lazarus was already dead four days. When his instructions don't make sense, Jesus told them to roll the stone away. That didn't make sense to Martha because Martha knew that he had been past the past the number of days where they even believed um, he could be raised. And it didn't, so it, it just didn't make sense that for them to follow his instructions. But the one thing that we can learn from Martha and the one thing that the one thing that we can learn from Martha, which is a mistake that some of us make, or I'll say it's a mistake that I may sometimes make, I'm not going to put anything on you, is that when we don't understand, we insert our own reason. We insert our own logic. We, um, you know, we're like, Lord, make it make sense. That's that's a common thing that people are saying, make it make sense. But that's not what um, Jesus told her. Jesus said, you will see the glory of God if you believe. That's what he said. He didn't say, you'll see the glory of God if you um, understand what I'm saying to you. So we must not insert our own logic or reason. Rather, we must resist our natural inclination because it's natural for us to want to understand things, especially people who are very logical. But we must resist this inclination. We must resist our own in intellect and we must submit to our spiritual discernment. Our spiritual discernment is going to um, urge us or nudge us to trust God, to believe God. So that's what we must lean into instead of our own natural inclination to try to understand. We must simply and wholly believe and obey God to fulfill his purpose and to give him glory. So our next he got up miracle is found and also in John, just a few chapters over. If you go to John chapter 20, verses one through 10, I'm very intentional about the place that I'm stopping um, in this story. <laughs> so let's go to John chapter 20, verses one through 10 for our third he got up story. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one who was the one whom Jesus loved. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, 
they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. While they were running, they were both running, excuse me, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus's head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. So the, the restoration of Lazarus' life set in motion the end of Jesus's natural life. It provided a glimpse of God's promise of, of resurrection, salvation, and eternal life. We didn't read it earlier, but if we were to go back and read John chapter 11, verse 22, Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. And Lazarus um, got a glimpse of that. Jesus was saying that he was the source of eternal life. And we also know um, that great salvation scripture also found in John chapter three, verses 16 through 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is significant because we heard last night that sin and death entered into the world through one man, Adam. And now sin and death are conquered by one man, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. In the story of Lazarus, Jesus told the people to remove the stone. So the next few points I'm going to make are some comparison stories between Lazarus and Jesus. So in the story of Lazarus, Jesus told the people to remove the stone from in front of the tomb. In the story of Jesus, Mary and the women who were with her arrived to find the stone had already been rolled away. Mary ran to get Peter and John. John arrived first and he didn't go in. He initially just stooped down and looked in. Peter arrived next and immediately went in. We're not surprised though, because we, we know Peter, right? <laughs> then John also went inside. So I'm not gonna talk about the women or the disciples. You'll have to tune in over the next couple of days and hear about their responses and their reactions. And like I said a few minutes ago, I'm intentionally stopping at verse 10 because I knew if I went beyond verse 10, I was gonna get in somebody else's word and I am not doing that tonight. So what I want you to get um, here is the difference between Lazarus um, a, occurrence and when Jesus and the people arrived that they had to remove the stone they had to remove the stone so that the miracle could be performed and the next thing that I want um, to get into so since I couldn't talk about the women and I couldn't talk about the disciples I'm glad because that caused me to look at the text a little more closely. And it caused me to do some research on something that I hadn't necessarily paid attention to before. And so in me moving on, what I wanna talk about are the grave clothes. 
I did some research on the grave clothes because I was I was curious. In John's account, I felt like he was very deliberate and very intentional about how he described the grave clothes. And I'm going to read that again before I get into this. Um, okay, starting at verse five. He, meaning John, stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there. And verse six, Simon Peter also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that had covered Jesus's head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. So what we just read in the story of Lazarus is when Jesus called Lazarus forth, Jesus, um, Lazarus was bound, right? I'm sorry, I don't know why I said right. Y'all can't talk back to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> In the story of Lazarus, when he got up and came out, he was bound in his grave clothes and Jesus ordered for the people to loose him. In the story of Jesus, we see that his grave clothes were lying there. John saw it first and then Peter also saw it. And not only were there linen wrappings lying there, but Jesus, the um, the covering that was over Jesus's head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. So this is what um, I found in what in in my research. It is thought that they were lying precisely as the body had lain in them. The grave clothes were in the exact were exactly in the position the body had occupied. So just a little um, education for me, it may be for you, but you might've already known this too. The manner in which they prepared the body for burial and that day was to wrap the body with a wide, long cloth, kind of like a giant bandage, beginning at the feet of the person and ending at the head. And as described in John 17, after um, the death of Jesus, <clears throat> Joseph, Joseph of Arithmetea and Nicolo Nicodemus prepared Jesus's body for burial. After they wrapped the cloth strips around Jesus's body, they poured about a hundred pounds of spices in. Now, the liquid spices would soon harden and cause the cloth wrappings to become like an encrusted cocoon. So kind of think about a cocoon, um, a butterfly's cocoon. It's hard um, and it's meant to, you know, in the case of the butterfly, it's meant to keep the, butter, the, the caterpillar, so, sorry, the caterpillar, it's meant to keep um, the caterpillar safe. Um, until it's time for him to come out. So just kind of imagine that this was, you know, just for imagination's sake, that this was um, the type of thing or the type of way Jesus was wrapped. Um, so the only human way a body could be removed from this cocoon would be by cutting the cloth from end to end and laying back each side so that the body could be pulled away. And this is likely what happened in the case of Lazarus. But again, Jesus is human, but Jesus is also God. Hallelujah. <laughs> and his clothes lie there uncut, undisturbed. And it was convincing that the body had been miraculously and supernaturally removed. The linen clothes lie empty in an empty tomb, praise God. Jesus had not been taken away from the tomb. He had not been put anywhere um, as the women had thought, but Jesus got up. He had risen. 
although they believe, as the text said, um, based upon what they observed at the tomb, they still have not yet fully understand the purpose of Jesus being raised from the dead. And here are some things, some truths that I want to um, lift up tonight about the resurrection of Jesus and what it means. The resurrection declared Jesus to be the son of God. That's number one, foremost um, the resurrection declared Jesus to be the son of God. The need for the son of God came at the fall of man. Several Old Testament prophets spoke of the coming Messiah who would save God's people. Even John was sent to prepare the way for Jesus in the New Testament. And because the Jews had a specific expect expectation of the Messiah, what he would look like, how would we, he would come, they rejected Jesus because Jesus came meek, Jesus came humble, Jesus came um, lowly, Jesus came as a servant. Jesus didn't come as a ruling king, he came as a servant. Um, Romans chapter one, verses two through four tells us that God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that's our foundational um, scripture for the fact that Jesus, the resurrection declared Jesus to be the son of God. Number two, the resurrection opened salvation for all. Hallelujah. We ought to be excited about that one. The resurrection opened salvation for all. The need for salvation was determined when sin occurred in the garden. Fellowship between man and God was broken. The only solution for perfect restoration was through the perfect sacrifice. Hallelujah. And I have two um, scriptures for this one. First Peter 1, 19 through 21 says, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him and so your faith and hope are in God. First Peter 1, three through five says, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because, Jesus, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So number two, again, the resurrection opened salvation for all. Number three, the resurrection assured righteousness for the believer. The resurrection assured righteousness for the believer. Again, well, not again, not this one, sorry. Jesus became, Jesus became sin, meaning he bore our sin as a righteous act of love. Because he was sinless, redemption could only come through him. Woo. Romans chapter four, verses 24 through 25. For our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. 
were so undeserving. My God. Ooh, but God, who knew no sin, he became the sin for us that we might be right with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, the third point is the resurrection assured righteousness for the believer. The fourth point, the resurrection established new life for the disciple. The resurrection established new life for the disciple. We are born in sin, but we are reborn by grace. As such, we have a responsibility as a Christian to be Christ-like and reconcile others to the Father as Jesus did. We also have a responsibility to disciple others, meaning to teach them, teach others, to serve others as Jesus did. So this new life that we have as a disciple of Christ, as a believer of Christ, as a Christian, is not one where we can say, you know, I've been saved, um, I am saved, and I can just, you know, skate on till glory. No. As a disciple, we have a responsibility. And Romans 6, chapter 4 through 7 tells us, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. It is so important for us to um, understand this scripture and to hold on to this scripture. Because just as the enemy beguiled Eve in the garden, he comes to beguile us too. He comes to trick us up. He comes to lie to us. He comes to deceive us in saying, <clears throat> because we may sin or we will sin or we do sin, um, that we don't have, we, we fall out of the power um, of Christ. And that is not true. So although we still sin because we are in the flesh, we are no longer slaves to sin. This is what um, Romans tells us. We are not slaves to sin because when, <clears throat> when Christ died, he gave us, he set us free from the power of sin. So there's a difference from committing a sin and the power of sin, right? What did the power of sin do? The power of sin um, set forth judgment and condemnation and death. But Christ, through his resurrection, gave us grace. Through his resurrection, he gave us um, the right to live in him. So we understand that's not a license to sin. Not at all. But what I want us to understand that when we do sin, and I say when because we are, sometimes it's unknowingly, sometimes it is unknowing. <laughs> sometimes we're well aware of what we're doing. Um, but even in that, we are still free from the power of sin. The power um, of that of, of Christ, the power that um, G, that Jesus obtained for us is still at work in our lives. So again, that one was the resurrection established new life for the disciple. And then the fifth 
thing that the resurrection did. And this is not an exhaustive list. I'm sure some of you are thinking of some things that um, that I didn't say, but these are just some things that um, I'm bringing forth today that all speak to um, the power of the resurrection for us as believers as well. So the resurrection secured our future resurrection. The resurrection secured future resurrection for believers. Even though we were born sinners through Adam, because we were reborn in Christ and restored to Christ, we will be resurrected just as he was. And we can find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. 1 Thessalonians 4, um, 13 through 14. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Here's this hope again. Um, that, that that Jesus gave to the widow. Um, for since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Amen. So those are um, our three, he got up, um, miracles that that we wanted to bring forth on tonight. Um, but before I end, <laughs> oh gosh, before I end tonight, I cannot end without making good use of this amazing acrostic. <laughs> and I don't want to let Minister Humphrey down because I know she was waiting for it. I know she was waiting for it. I know it. I know it. And um, to be honest, it, it took some time for it all to come together. Like I tried all kind of words um, for this got up, but praise God, it, it, it finally came together. It finally came together. So for all those that, that know Minister, Minister Humphrey and um, either the, the titles that she gives me or the titles that she lets me choose, um, I'm, you know, I think I'm probably known for, for an acrostic and, and I'm not going to disappoint you tonight. We are going to end with this acrostic for Jesus got up or for got up. So in all of these, um, Jesus got up so that we can be, okay. Jesus got up so that we can be. So the first one, G, cause I'm just doing got up. So Jesus got up glorified so that we can be glorified in our body. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 44. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 44. There are also bodies in the heavens and bodies on the earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory while the moon and stars each have another kind. And even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised to glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. So Jesus got up glorified so that we can be glorified. Next, Jesus got up obedient so that we can be obedient. Jesus got up obedient so that we can be obedient. And we're... Um, Obedient to God, that is. Acts chapter 5, verses 29 through 32. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at his right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel 
would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit who is given by God to those who obey him. Next, Jesus got up triumphant so that we can be triumphant. And that triumphant is over Satan and death. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58. First Corinthians 51, first Corinthians 15, excuse me, 51 through 58. <clears throat> But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies will be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Next, we um, Jesus got up united so that we can be united. Jesus got up united so that we can be united with Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 11. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counted it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. And then Jesus got up powerful so that we can be powerful. Jesus got up powerful so that we can be powerful in Christ. And that last scripture for tonight is Ephesians chapter one, verses 19 through 21. Ephesians 1, 19 through 23, excuse me. Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and he has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete in Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So once again, Jesus got up glorified so that we can be glorified in our body. 
Jesus got to be obedient so that we can be obedient to God. Jesus got up triumphant so that we can be triumphant over Satan and death. Jesus got up united so that we can be united with Christ. And Jesus got up powerful so that we can be powerful in Christ. So the last thing I want to say, and I'm going to close, I read this somewhere and I didn't cite the source, um, but I noted it and I just wanted to close with this. Jesus was our obedient substitute during life, during his life. He was our punishment substitute in his death. And he was our rebirth substitute in his resurrection. So on this second day of Holy Week, I want you to make a commitment to honor the sacrifice, the sacrificial work of Christ Jesus by receiving him as your savior, if that is something that you have not done, um, or by trusting him as your Lord, if you have already received him as your savior. May God bless you and keep you. I'm going to turn it back over to Minister Humphrey. Amen. Deaconess Owens, will you lead um, those who want to be saved? Will you lead them through the prayer of salvation at this time? Yes. Yes. So if you are listening to this and um, you have not yet accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, we um, ask that you would just take a moment, just pause and take a moment. And we ask that you would first um, acknowledge that you are a sinner. We talked in here about um, sin starting with Adam and we know that we are all sinners. So first acknowledge that you are sin a sinner. And then the next thing that we want you to do is we want you to believe that Jesus Christ came, gave himself, gave his life for you that you might be saved. And the next thing that we want you to do is confess <clears throat> that Jesus is Lord. Confess him as your savior. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time, oh God. God, we ask that you would touch the heart of the unbeliever today. God, we ask that you would make the heart of the unbeliever, oh God, palatable to you. Make the heart, oh God, um, in such a way, soft in such a way that they might receive you to be their Lord. God, let the unbeliever know that you love them. Let them know that you care for them. Let them know that you came and you died and you rose again so that they might have life in you. So God, we ask that you would touch that heart now. And we ask that you would draw the heart unto you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, and as they open their mouth and as they confess you as Savior, as they open their life and they say that they want you to lead and guide their life. God, we believe with them that they are saved on today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We believe and we rejoice. Hallelujah. In the salvation that someone, God, hearing this prayer would receive and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for sending this word, hallelujah, to let me know that you care for me. God, we thank you. We honor you. We give you glory. We give you praise. And we rejoice, hallelujah. We rejoice because Satan has lost again, hallelujah. We rejoice, hallelujah, because Jesus has won again. We thank you, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Lord God, we praise you and we honor you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So if you are that woman, if you are that man, if you are that boy or that girl that just heard that prayer and prayed with us, 
We ask, Lord, that you would reach out to Minister Humphrey. Um, we ask that if you're able to put in the comment section that you have received the Lord Jesus tonight as your savior um, and connect with her. She will be that disciple that we talked about earlier that will walk along with you, that will teach you, that will help you, that will um, help you to develop in your relationship with Christ. Because we know that being saved saying yes to Jesus, giving him our heart is just the first step. There is so much more that he wants from you. There is so much more that he wants to do in you and through you. And we just honor you. And we are just so grateful and thank you for the decision that you have made today. Amen. Amen to God be the glory. Hallelujah for the great things that he has done tonight. That was such an awesome, powerful teaching about he got up. Hallelujah. As you were going through the miracles, Deaconess uh, Tasha, I was thinking about my teaching for a Friday night. I was like, okay, we kind of on the same lines on that. But oh my God, that was was such a powerful teaching of course I took some notes y'all yes I initially I was looking for the acrostic but I was like she don't have to do it every time I haven't done it the last two times so I ain't gonna mess with that <laughs> that's that's between her and God that's their business not mine Amy. <laughs> but I appreciate that got up acrostic and those scriptures that was good and you know of all the notes that I wrote down what really ministered to me because God is um I taught the word on Sunday and God was really ministering to me afterwards. And when you said Jesus didn't do anything outside of what the father's will, outside of what the father's will was for him, that really ministered to me, that really ministered to me. Thanks. So it was a good word. And I thank God for you allowing the Lord to use you to teach to us tonight, to pour wisdom and flowing in the anointing of God. It was so rich and so good and so powerful. So I thank God for it. Y'all, I know y'all got that word. Now, I know you got it. I know y'all was taking notes because well, there wasn't too many of y'all chatting with me. <laughs> so I know y'all was soaking it in. Hallelujah. So we thank God for the woman of God and for her laboring to get the word that God gave her to deliver to us on tonight. It was a powerful word, a powerful teaching, and we thank God for it. And like Deaconess Tasha said, if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord on tonight, reach out to me, contact me, let me know that you are saved and I will support you in every way I can. I will help you find a Bible teaching church where you can grow and develop in who God has called you to be, where you can uh, be, uh, be in an atmosphere where God can sanctify you and wash all the world out of you and replace it with his newness um, in you and his His um, grace and his mercy and his character so that he can do have that even exchange. Y'all know what uh, Deacon Natasha Owens te taught um, some years ago, the divine exchange. I have not forgotten that. Some words just stick with you. And that doggone divine exchange, it was during the pocketbook exchange. I think it was like maybe 2010 or 2011. It was early on when Be Free Ministries um, was released. Divine, I have never forgot that divine exchange, but God will give you a divine exchange where he will get you out of you. <laughs> and replace you with him so that you can fulfill the destiny that he has placed within you and so you can be more like him so that you can be free and free indeed so you'll no longer be bound to sin as Deacon as Owens taught to us on tonight so yes reach out to me reach out to me on my contact page I'll actually add it to the description after the broadcast you can have easy access to it okay amen something I, I very rarely do I don't know that I've ever done this but as Deacon Tasha Owens was bringing forth the word, the Lord said, donate, like donate. So give an offering that may not be for you. And that's OK. But if the Lord is leading you to give an offering to be free ministries, I will make sure our speakers will have a donation for this week. This he got up service. I do not have a budget for be free ministries. When I take money in, I give it right back out to the speakers who are speaking at the various events that we have throughout the year for be free ministries. But if you feel so led to give tonight, if you feel so led to donate, I'm actually going to put the link in the chat. You may not feel led to do it tonight. Maybe you want to do it another 
another day this week. Maybe you want to wait till Resurrection Sunday, but that's I'm just telling you what the Lord said. <laughs> Take it up with him. <laughs> Take it up with him. So I'm going to put our donation link in if you feel so led to sow a seed into the ministry and bless the teachers that are bringing forth the word tonight. We will greatly appreciate it. If you do not feel so led, then that's okay too. You let the Lord lead you because we want to make, we want to support you in fulfilling the assignment that God has given you. We want to support you as you are being led by the Lord. So if you want to give, we're going to help you be led. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So our giving link is added right now to the chat. If you want to give, amen, amen. So again, we thank God for the word that came forth on tonight. I pray that you will allow that Lord, that the, not the Lord, well, allow the Lord, but let that word from the Lord soak into your spirit, permeate your being, your, your soul, your spirit, your emotions, your mind. Let that word soak in so that you will be revived and restored and so that resurrection power can forever be maintained within your being. Amen. So we ask God that you, God, will restore everything that Deaconess Tasha Owens gave out tonight. God, pour back into her as she sleeps in the name of Jesus. Let your angels cover her and protect and keep her as she rests on tonight. I declare and decree peaceful sleep, peaceful rest to her body, her mind, and soul, God, in the name of Jesus. I dispatch your angels, Lord God, to protect her, to be around her bedside, around her home, around her um, neighborhood, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for restoring and replenishing and reviving Deacon Natasha Owens for everything that she gave out to us on tonight. God, we bless you. We receive the word. Hallelujah. And we will apply the word to our lives, Lord God. And we will share the word. Hallelujah. As Deacon Owens said, we, we will share the word. We will go forth in the Great Commission and make disciples, Lord God, as you have assigned us to do. God, we love you. We bless you. I pray that you will bless every person under the sound of my voice right now. Everybody who joined the uh, service on tonight, bless them, restore them, revive them, give them everything that they need, that they desire. God, according to your riches and glory, let your grace be sufficient for them. Supply every need, Father God, for them in the name of Jesus. Let your angels, God, be dispatched on their behalf. Hallelujah. Keeping and protecting them as they rest on tonight and as they go about their days this week. God, we love you. God, we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to give the service back over to Deacon Natasha Owen. She's going to give us our closing prayer. And I'm going to go ahead and say my end. Well, I'll wait till she finishes and I'll say my end. So Deacon Natasha. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you for life, health, and strength, God. We thank you for being with us during this time. We thank you for providing your word because we know that your word is life to the hearer. God, we thank you, God. Hallelujah. For reminding some, God, and informing some, oh God, that there is resurrection power in your word. There's resurrection power in your name. God, we thank you hallelujah, that you got up. God, you could have decided that it was too much to bear, God. Our sin could have been too much, God, for you, God, to endure, God. Hallelujah. But we thank you, God, that because of your love, God, for us, God, because of your love for the Father, God, you were obedient even unto death, God. And in your obedience, God, hallelujah, oh God, you are yet rewarded with eternal life, God. And not only that, God, we thank you that you also invited us to have eternal life, oh God, hallelujah. God, we thank you, hallelujah, that not only do we live in you on this earth, God, but we will live in you forever. God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. God, we cannot thank you enough for the sacrifice that you have made on our behalf. We can't thank you enough, God. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus, for all that you have done, God. God, even in the resurrection, God, even if you don't do anything else for us, oh God, hallelujah, we are grateful for your resurrection. 
God, and we don't count it lightly, oh God. God, but we honor you. We reverence you, oh God. Hallelujah. Oh Lord Jesus, we give your name the glory. We give your name the praise that it is due. God, you are mighty God. You're a holy God. You're a worthy God. And we ask that you would be with us, God, as we leave this service. God, we ask that your presence, God, would remain with us, oh God, even until even until the night, God, even for the remainder of these days, God, let every service be blessed, oh God. Let every service be powerful, God. Let your presence and your purpose be um, known, God, and be revealed in every service, God. God, we ask that you would bless the remaining speakers, oh God. We ask that you would bless Minister Humphrey, oh God. Continue to strengthen her, oh God. Continue, Lord Jesus, to lead and guide her into your truth, God. To lead and guide her into um, your purpose, oh God. Continue to order her steps in your word. In the name of Jesus, continue to bless her ministry. Continue, Lord Jesus, just to cause her ministry to make an impact for you, O oh God, so that your kingdom will be advanced, O oh God, so that your kingdom will be increased, O oh God. So we thank you for every hearer, God. Hallelujah. We pray that something was said, O oh God, that will encourage, that will enlighten, that will strengthen, O oh Lord Jesus, that will save, O oh God, and heal and deliver, God, whatever it is that you desire, to be the result of your word, God, we thank you for it. We don't limit you, Lord, but we thank you. God, we ask once again that you would be with us as we leave this place, God, but never from your presence. Bring us back at, at the appointed time, oh God, without the loss of one. It is in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So we will see you all back tomorrow night at 7 p.m. My aunt, Sister Wanda Humphrey, will bring forth the word on He Got Up. The women, uh, ooh, I, I was supposed to re remember it and now I can't even think of it. Mm, I'm going to look it up. Y'all give me a minute I, after that powerful prayer. Mm. And I'm stumbling. Woo, praise God. The role of the women. He got up the role of the women. So join us again tomorrow at 7. Amen. Amen. Y'all be blessed. Don't forget to like, subscribe, invite your family, friends, and coworkers, and let them know the word of the Lord is going forth in a He Got Up resurrection service. Amen. Amen.